Hi everyone, here's what's bothering me today. If you get $800 a week unemployment benefits, and you live with a partner who also is getting $800 a week unemployment benefits, $1,600 a week, Laura, $83,000 a year for that household in unemployment benefits. The median income in America is only $63,000. We're incentivizing people to stay home. What if we gave that additional unemployment benefits to employers to incentivize people to go to work? Well, what if, what if we just cut off the unemployment? I mean, yeah, hunger is a, it, hunger is a pretty powerful thing. I don't mean physical hunger because people who truly in, are in need need help. I'm talking about people who can work but refuse to work. But the government is is literally putting anvils in many ways on people's shoulders, either through the mandates, regulations, and now through free money, which obviously we're all gonna. The piper eventually has to be paid. Uh, John, yeah. John, I want to ask you though about. This, this idea of work-life balance. Because, look, no one wants to miss their kids growing up. No one wants to, you, know, you stay in the office your whole life, you, you, you never see your family. So I, that's really important. However, have we taken that a step too far when you think of, well, a lot of the millennials talking about, well, oh, I need time for self-care. I don't know why I'm harping on that tonight, but the whole self-care movement is a little, I mean, my mother's not with us anymore, but she worked from the time she was 12 during the Depression. If she heard the self-care thing, I think her head would explode. <laughs> you know, I think that's right. Old I school. have a friend in the military who trains military dogs, Laura, and they only feed a military dog at night because a hungry dog is an obedient dog. Well, if we're not causing people to be hungry to work, that, then we're providing them with all the meals they need sitting at home. I'm completely with you, Laura. These benefits make absolutely no sense to us. And on top of the impact of not getting employees and not being able to run our businesses, in my industry, we have meat prices are up 10 percent, chicken prices are up 15 percent. Now, inflation is killing, though, is killing is going to kill business. That is noted shit heel and actual fascist Laura Ingram and some creepy weird dude talking about how dare people have money while being poor and actually getting a fair wage. They're totally cheating the system, right? Yeah, people, you know, you, you got to have people hungry and that'll force them to actually go back to work. We need people to be desperate. The dude even talks about how in the military they only feed the dogs at night because a hungry dog is an obedient dog. Republicans really are just saying the quiet part out loud now. We want and need you to be desperate in order for this system to work. And yet, the title there is left chipping away at American work ethic. Why does the American work ethic need to revolve around borderline indentured servitude? Plenty of other countries, like, you know, Germany and Japan, for instance, also have a very hard-working populace. They still get benefits and fight for their rights and for time off and having enough money to feed, clothe, and house themselves. Like, what? Welcome to the capitalist death cult that is America. And welcome to the Sunday sum up, everybody. It's just another Sunday. And so speaking of America, we got to talk about Florida real quick. I could probably do a massive deep dive into all the ways in which Florida has become a horror show over the course of the pandemic, but ain't nobody really got time for that. So let's just focus on the fact that a single Florida school district called an emergency meeting after over 5,500 students were forced to quarantine over a COVID-19 outbreak. Because Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, is basically making it impossible for anyone to have any human decency and COVID safety protocols. And with the Delta variant running rampant both in his state and across America, the spread amongst children who again are unvaxxed has been tremendous and not in the great way. Imagine over 5,500 students in a single school district having to quarantine. That is a problem, people. And yet Governor DeSantis, who decides to ban schools and businesses from implementing mask mandates, any children who die or get sick, that's on him. Again, isn't it so great seeing the pro-life crowd be so pro-death? To give you an idea of what Floridians with any sense have to deal with, Superintendent Addison Davis had issued a requirement that all students wear masks, but Governor Ron DeSantis, a Republican, has prohibited such mandates, 
forcing the school district to allow any parent who wishes to opt out their child with a note. My sympathies to the people of Florida. You are not having a good time down there. And again, on the subject of COVID and the American capitalist death cult, which maybe that's the theme emerging here. I don't know. We'll have to see with the rest of the terrible news stories. Why do I do this to myself? Why does anyone watch this? According to this person on Twitter, someone at my mom's workplace who has COVID and was on a ventilator for more than a week up until earlier today joined a Zoom meeting from the ICU because her boss told her she needed to start working remotely as soon as she was off the ventilator. What the fuck? Th this is like that meme of, you know, the boss crying at, you know, their worker's funeral. How could you do this to me? We're understaffed today. This has that same energy. Like, this woman is still in the ICU and her boss has the audacity to say, Well, you better clock in as soon as the ventilator's out your mouth. Rest and recovery are kind of necessary, you spectacular douchebag. This also reminds me of one of my, I guess by this point in time, earliest videos was about an Australian professor who collapsed while teaching an online lecture and later died as a result of that because she had COVID, but was still being forced by the university in Argentina to teach. This shit is indefensible, and yet we have people like Laura Ingram and whoever that other ghoul was defending this system that is literally killing people. Hey, Trudeau and Freeland, victims of capitalism memorial when? All right, on to the next story. Hey, so remember how, you know, there was the whole housing bubble in 2008 and then that crashed and things were really not good for a while? Well... Home prices are now higher than the peak of the 2000s housing bubble. What gives? Yeah, home prices are now higher than they were during the last collapse. So what's changed? Even before the pandemic pushed the U.S. housing market into overdrive, the price of the average American home was on a rocket ride, climbing more than 50% between 2012 and 2019. It was the third largest housing boom in American history. Then came the pandemic, marked by a buying frenzy and a selling freeze, which created a supply-demand mismatch that made the price boom go into warp speed. The average price of American homes, in real terms, is now the highest it's ever been, even higher than the peak of the housing bubble in 2006 before it crashed 60% and bottomed out in 2012. The rest of the article is kind of meh, and it goes all over the place and kind of skirts around several major issues that I've talked about at length at this point. But basically, to broadly sum up, it's because the pandemic showed people wanted more space and, oh, we can work remotely. So now they're considering places in the country or the suburbs. But since those places tend to not build so much housing, hence the whole, oh, look, supply and demand. And that's why prices are going through the roof. However, this doesn't account for the fact that real estate firms are just buying up houses and condos as part of basically retirement pension schemes. So it's investments, but no one's living in them. So really there is an adequate supply. It's just not profitable to house everyone. And can we just please think of the developers and their millions, if not billions of dollars? And also again, to sum up, if you're expecting another bubble to burst, that isn't happening based on the way things are currently being handled in terms of it being an investment. So unless there's a way in which they're messing around with that, that could then crash in the future and we don't know about it yet, well then maybe. But right now it looks like the fight has to be made towards affordable housing. Yay, another serious fight that's going to affect all of us. I can't wait for us to have energy for yet another fight. And then another issue that I've not seen talked about, but it's increasingly becoming a problem. Fentanyl is creeping into the mainstream drug supply. Post-lockdown, social drug users are facing a new normal where the drug supply, including cocaine and meth, is increasingly tainted with fentanyl. Yeah, I remember fentanyl, the big old boogeyman. It was especially big here in Canada. Well, apparently lots of young, wealthy socialites are taking drugs that are being tainted with fentanyl. They're now being hospitalized after taking the first bump of cocaine. And to give you an idea on the numbers and how bad it is, overdose deaths soared nearly 30% from 2019 to more than 93,000 in 2020, according to preliminary CDC data released in July. And in terms of a harrowing boots on the ground perspective, 
Today, pretty much every cocaine and meth user in Ohio knows there's a risk of fentanyl in their drugs, said Dennis Cochon, the president of Harm Reduction Ohio, which has been tracking fentanyl contaminated cocaine since 2017. Two years ago, this wasn't the case. Today it is. That is horrifying. Also, I forget which one of the Sunday sum-ups it was, but a while ago now, I also talked about how, you know, it was cops in Ottawa who were pushing fentanyl onto the streets to serve and protect everybody. So that's what I got for America. How about some international news? Australia, which somewhat famously had a pretty good grip on the pandemic early on, things aren't going so great right now. According to Andrew Clennell, there was a new record in New South Wales, and this was on August 18th, where more than 650 new cases were detected. So yeah, it's spreading and it's a problem. And then in walks Devin Leonhelm, who has this galaxy brain take. Mass detention camps are the only solution, concentrating people other than journalists into areas where they can be controlled. Please ask why they're not doing that at the presser. Bro, are you legit advocating for concentration camps? I'm not a fan of the unvaccinated conspiracy theorists either, but holy fuck. It's the only solution. No, it really isn't. So yeah, probably not a fun time to be in Australia right now. It's also not a fun time to be a chimpanzee in West Africa. A Chinese-backed consortium is developing transport infrastructure for a massive iron ore mine in Guinea, the home to nearly two-thirds of the remaining estimated 52,800 Western chimpanzees in the wild. So yeah, China is throwing money to help Guinea build this giant iron ore mine. To do that, they need to do a lot of blasting to also set up a rail line to go to the ore to then extract it and then bring it to the coast so that it can then go to global markets. And there's no plan to protect the chimpanzees, even though the land that it's going through is the home of, again, the vast majority of Western chimpanzees. Mm. Yes, economic development is important. Does that have to come at the expense of everyone in the planet, though? Is there really not a better way? I thought capitalism was supposed to be innovative and efficient. And then speaking of the planet, here's some news that probably not a lot of people have seen. Rain fell at the normally snowy summit of Greenland for the first time on record. It rained on top of the Greenlandic ice sheet. For the first time ever. The giant, cold, snowy plateau of Greenland saw rain for the first time. And again, related to Greenland. In July, the Greenland ice sheet experienced one of the most significant melting events in the past decade, losing more than 8.5 billion tons of surface mass in a single day, which was enough to submerge Florida in two inches of water. It was the third instance of extreme melting in the past decade, during which time the melting has stretched further inland than the entire satellite era, which began in the 1970s. So it's raining in places that it shouldn't be. We're destroying habitats for iron. Worse and worse drugs are being pushed on the street in order to help people cope with the increasingly capitalist death cult that is just taking over more and more of the West. Is this really the best that humanity can do? You're telling me that this is the best, most fair, best possible system we can come up with? This is good and right and just? There has to be a better way than this. And I think people on some level recognize that. Sure, not everyone can agree on, you know, socialism, social democracy, anarchism, you know, the war of ideologies that we all take part in every day on social media. But I think we can all agree that this is not working. It is not good and it needs to end now. We're forcing people to go back to work from the ICU of a hospital once they're off a ventilator in a pandemic that was entirely avoidable. And yet leaders are making it so that, no, you're not allowed to wear a mask because I said so, even though it's against the best interests of public health. Like... So much of this world is so wrong and we all recognize it. And yet we continue to vote for parties that do the same thing. Whether you're team red or team blue, the same terrible things happen day after day, month after month, and year after godforsaken year. 
Either we need to start voting in very different people and parties, or the time for revolution is very clearly at hand. Just hearing all these stories from the past week should be ringing alarm bells for those who haven't already heard them. And for the rest of us, it should really just set into our minds that this is not okay and it's not getting better. So how do we make it better? We have to stop doing what we're doing. We have to hold our politicians to account. We have to engage in direct action and direct democracy because otherwise, this is going to continue. And there's going to be similar stories like this next week, next month, next year, years from now. And that's what's bothering me today.